the first rule of journalism I learned from my dad was the questions are more important than the answers. Second, when asking questions, good reporters use the five W's and H. Third, facts must have two independent sources, if not attributed to one speaker. Fourth, editors provide a vital role. They keep reporters from jumping the gun and publishing stories without all the facts. With today's millions of sources, we're dealing with more data and less information. We are the editors now. On today's show, my guest and I will explore some of the events leading up to how we receive news today, what's driving the narrative, and what my guest has learned along the way. He's been a CIA officer, a New York Times magazine editor, a comedy writer for Bob Newhart, and a talent coordinator for The Tonight Show. So you know there's a story or two right there. An internationally noted novelist, he's the author of 10 books. One of his novels, Surprise Party, is in 54 editions. His website, UrgentAgenda.com, is one I read every day. After today's show, you'll know why. Welcome to the show, William Katz. Well, thank you, sir. I'm glad to be here. Well, please allow me to set the stage here. Um, COVID-19 has many dots to connect, and it's teaching us some very harsh lessons of late. And I wrote some bullet points down because I'm not going to commit them to memory. Yeah, I can't. I'm, I'm too old for that. <laughs> so dealing with information being thrown at us from a million sources is one. And we're losing the who, what, where, when, why, and how of great reporting. On top of that, we're now the editors too. But we aren't trained for that. And we're basing massive decisions on what may be missing information or outright lies. China's numbers are suspect. So when I thought of doing a show about all this and the need for being our own news editor, Guess what? I instantly thought of you, and so here you are, Bill. What say you? <laughs> well, uh, I think it's, a, first of all, an exceedingly important subject. Um, you know, we talked very grandly about freedom of the press uh, in the United States, and there's a, there was a press critic in the 1950s and 60s named A.J. Liebling, a very famous man, and uh, who used to say, Freedom of the press belongs to the man who owns one. Uh, today, we all, in a way, own a press. It, it is a remarkable transition that we're going through in the flow of information. When the First Amendment was written, uh, guaranteeing freedom of the press, it was written before the age of electricity. Many people don't realize that. There is no way in the world that the founders of this country could have predicted what the press, or the media as we call it today, would look like in the year 2020. They had no, no idea how to plug anything in because nothing could be plugged in. There was no electricity. The words the press actually meant a man working in a basement, probably with a teenage son, at a printing press and doing it page by page and circulating possibly a two or three page newspaper. That's what the press was. Uh, today we have a press that has two enormous char characteristics. One, it's very democratic in the sense that anyone can get online and say their piece. On the other hand, it's frightening because we have these huge international conglomerates passing themselves off as journalistic organizations that claim that they are the, the, the gatekeeper, they are the, the uh, watchdog over American democracy, and we usually find that they're only watching one side of the, of the political argument. I think most people have sensed even if they may not be able to articulate it, that something is very wrong. And it didn't start yesterday. It started probably during the Vietnam era. We used to say uh, during that era that if the United States had the press in World War II that it had in Vietnam, we would have lost World War II. We began to see the transition from reporting the news without fear or favor to, well, this is our opinion, and we're really much better than you are at home, and we can tell you these things Reporting is kind of a minor part of the effort. 
And I'm sorry to say that idea has grown into what you see today. The CNNs, the New York Times, I was on the New York Times. This is a completely different newspaper than the one I served back in the 1960s. The importance of editors. Editors are critically important because every writer needs an editor, including really good writers. When I was on the Times, I was an editor, and I edited some very famous people. They all needed editors. Somebody has to be the watchdog over the reporter and must interrupt that raw information that comes through and instead of putting it right into the newspaper, make certain that everything is right, that it's read, that it's researched, uh, and then it goes into the paper if it is a relevant story. Right now you have not only in the press, but in publishing and in certain parts of the government, news without editors, uh, books without editors. The great book editors of the past are no longer with us. Today it's the marketing director who basically runs the publishing house. Uh, you have people who often don't have enough experience to be editors. We used to talk about the curmudgeoning old editors. Those editors were good. And one of the things they were very good at and what the media today is very bad at, and it applies really throughout the economy, is vocabulary. Words mean whatever they, they want them to mean. They use a word like diversity. They never talk about what it actually means in real life, which is not what it's supposed to mean. They will talk uh, uh, about uh, ethnicity, uh, different groups in ways that the groups themselves wouldn't even recognize. And they will say, well, this is not only our right, it's our responsibility to analyze now, I happened to work at the Times under a man named Lester Markell, who was really the founder of modern interpretive journalism. And he always warned us how dangerous it was that the line between interpretation and editorialization is very thin. And that, uh, that applies not only to the press, to radio and television, it applies to advertising, it applies to a discussion of health care. Uh, you, you need, you need somebody to say, no, this is not a fact. It's just your opinion that you're making into a fact. So I think we have a crisis, a word that is overused itself in communications in America. People believe, or at least some have believed that they were getting a story when in fact they were getting an editorial. Uh, we still are paying the price for that kind of journalism used in Vietnam and uh, it is an open wound in this society. You know, what many people don't realize that the North Vietnamese wrote an official history of the war in which they admitted that they had lost. But it was never the, that, that remarkable passage in the book where they said we were defeated and we sued for peace has never been read over any American news network. It's, it's stunning. It really is stunning. Is there a link to that I can provide? I mean, would... Where would I? Where would we find that? Because I'll try. I, I'd be happy to dig it up and put it in the description so people can actually. I don't know. That. I don't know where you'd find the book. I mean, the official North Vietnamese history of the Vietnam War should be available to everyone. Uh, for some reason, it disappeared many years ago. I have not seen a copy in perhaps twenty or thirty years. But it was stunning because the their official history. It's, it, you know. It's strange about military histories. Very often, even dictatorships want them accurate. Uh, it's, I, I don't know what, what, what the instinct is. Maybe they're afraid that if they do a propaganda piece, their own military will turn against them. But, um, Nazis. We, well, yes, yes. <clears throat> but we are not getting today the kind of news that we were told we were supposed to deliver when I was at the Graduate School of Journalism in 1962. Uh, it was uh, very closely supervised by editors from the New York Times, which at that time was a great newspaper. Not always great, but great enough. And we have lost the influence of the reporters in the what we call the greatest generation. You know, we think of the greatest generation, Tom Brokaw's phrase, as the soldiers, the home front, Nobody ever thinks about the fact that we had a press that did a remarkable job in World War II. And one of the reasons they did a remarkable job is they had lived through very hard times themselves in the Depression. Yep. They, knew how, they knew how serious this was. I have an actress friend who has a wonderful phrase about young people today. And, and, and she says, one of the reasons they are often so shallow is that they've never seen strife, real strife. They've actually grown up in very easy times until this 
bump that we've, we've hit, and this is a big bump, and maybe this will change them, that the world is a serious place. A presidential election is not a football game. Yeah. Uh, and, and one of the things that makes any great news organization uh, is the great editor at the top, the person who lays down the rules and says, this is the way it's going to be, and if you don't like it, you can leave, but we're not going to change it for you. Because you, you feel something in your blood that you must say. If you feel something in your blood that you must say, go work for the editorial page. That is what is needed. Uh, the, the level of editing is so low. And that level of editing is a direct result of an educational system that has become very lax, that has become very propagandistic, uh, where uh, my narrative and your narrative are equally valid. And everyone's narrative is equally valid. And who are we to say that someone's narrative is wrong? Well, the purpose of any good investigation, whether it's in, in health care that you deal with, is that the narrative has to be challenged. And you have to find out what the correct narrative is. The quality of our, of our information will depend on what people think their jobs are. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear all the time in journalism, a reporter will say, we're just doing our job. Well... I would like to know what he thinks his job is or what she thinks her job is. I think we would be shocked at the answer very often. What what concerns you the most about the information we're being given about COVID-19? I think what concerns me the most is the fact that we have so many people giving us the news who are scientifically illiterate. They know absolutely nothing about science and they don't have any interest in it. I'll tell you a story. When I was a student at the University of Chicago, uh, we were required to take uh, a course called Natural Sciences I, or Physical Sciences I. I think they change the name every now and then. It was a course that other universities call Physics for Poets. It is a course not for scientists or for science students, but for non-science students to learn what they need to know about science to function as a citizen. And we... I had, to be, I had to be dragged into the course, like many other political science majors. I was dragged in, they, they put me down, they strapped me down, and I took the course. And we began the readings, and the readings were one failed experiment after another. One scientific thesis that later proved to be wrong after another. And I went up to the instructor one day and I said, Professor, why are we learning all these wrong theories? And he said, and this is a phrase I will always remember, it's the one phrase I got out of college that I've never forgotten. He said, we want you to understand how science proceeds. Pro science proceeds with great difficulty. It, it, is, it is brutally difficult. You never know what's around the corner. And the way it's reported today is the scientist is the Superman, the He-Man with the white coat, and on the other side are these politicians and these ordinary citizens, and they don't understand what we understand. That's not, way, that's not the way science is at all. Science is filled with debate. It's filled with doubt. Um, scientific theories are overthrown. You know, Einstein was challenged in the 1930s by the Hitler regime. Uh, Hitler gathered together 200 of Germany's most prominent scientists to write a paper showing that the theory of relativity was wrong. He didn't want to give Einstein... Uh, any credit at all for doing anything. And they published this paper, and uh, when Einstein traveled to America once, there was a reporter meeting the ship, and he interviewed Einstein, and he said, Professor Einstein, how can you challenge what 200 of Germany's best scientists are saying? And he said, wonderful answer. He said, it doesn't take 200 scientists to prove me wrong. It takes one fact. And that fact, of course, never turned up. And you have people today, I mean, you, you watch these 24-hour news services, which put great pressure on the reporters to come up with news every day. Sometimes there isn't any. Sometimes there isn't any. They have to understand how difficult this is, how difficult science is. Go back to your high school class. Who were the people who went to medical school and went into physics and chemistry? They were the people at the tops of the classes. You didn't find anybody at the bottom of the class, right. you know, becoming a, becoming a physicist. And you, you get the scientific illiteracy um, and the belief that we must, we must worship the scientist. Oh, no, don't worship the scientist. Question the scientist. 
you, you, or you're seeing for the first time now in the president's daily briefings some real revelation of scientific debate at a time of crisis that when when for example a candidate says we should bring in the experts my answer i talk back to the television set which never argues with me uh this the what we should be saying is which scientists are you talking about team a or team b and if you if, if i can relate it to other areas including the healthcare area and including uh climate change I mean, there are newspapers that have made, as a matter of policy, a decision not to admit to their pages anyone who doubts the um, the standard uh, concerns about climate change. That's terrible. Yeah. What if those people turn out to be right? So what you have, what you have today, and what really concerns me, is you have a great deal of illiteracy on the part of the very people who are teaching this literacy. I've learned so much from you over the years and of, of reading uh, Urgent Agenda. And you once wrote, and I've got it written here, we're told that journalism is history's first rough draft. We have the right to ask, where's the second draft? Can you please elaborate further, maybe using the pandemic as a backdrop? Well, the, the phrase, of course, was based on Ben Bradley's phrase that history, or rather journalism, is history's first draft. That was uh, original with him. And it was really a warning to the public that not everything printed on Tuesday is going to be valid on Thursday because the facts will change, new facts will come out, oh, new true. interpretations will come out. I mean, uh, it, it wasn't until the 1960s that we learned that Franklin Roosevelt had a mistress throughout all his years in the White House. Uh, and it, it really did change our interpretation, at least a personal interpretation, of Roosevelt. Now, when I say, when, when Bradley said it's history's rough first draft, the second draft has usually come from historians. You know, years later they will write, but we haven't got time for that. Uh, the, the, the papers will print, and there will be no great curiosity about whether what we printed today was really accurate. I think that it is owed to the American people to have in effect, a formal department in every newspaper called the second draft. It's like the cold case squad in, in police departments. Good years analogy. later, yeah, years later, facts come out and they change what we know. Um, an example I, I, I love to use is the example of the decision by Harry Truman to use the atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. There were many, many people who had opinions at the time. There were many journalists uh, who had opinions at the time. And then back in, oh, I guess it was 60s or 70s, there kind of was a little industry in the academic world to study the decision. And it was perfectly obvious what the purpose of the industry was, and that was to make Truman look bad. These were left-wing historians, and they studied, and they studied. But to their credit, uh, there was a professor at Stanford in particular, to his great credit, over the years, he changed his mind. And that's that's a really good second draft because he actually went in about it as a true historian. But that is what we need in journalism itself. The journalist to look over past editions and say, you know, this really wasn't quite accurate. And it gave an impression that people still have that's wrong. And to correct things as you go along, because the way things are now, the sloppiness is so great that stories go in, and unless somebody catches it on the outside, or unless the target of some new story catches it and demands a retraction, it will stay in people's minds. And people have not been, let's just say there have been a lot of people that have not <clears throat> taken the time to do that. No. Um, and I would observe that our current president does that. <laughs> Sometimes with you know, he's, he is who he is. He's from Queens. Yes, he uh, is. <laughs> you know, and if a lot of people don't don't know, if if you've met enough New Yorkers from Queens, you under you get it. You understand. I lived in Queens. Okay, well, then, yeah, you know. just for just for a few years then. <laughs> well, we're here with William Katz today, and Bill Urgent Agenda. It reminded me of Winston Churchill's Action This Day stamp. So what's the genesis of Urgent Agenda's name? Where did that come from? I thought it up one day, and it sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could give you a sexier answer, but it just it rolls off the lips. You know, I, it's, 
I read it. it was, this is interesting. I was thinking of this very thing last night about um, uh, uh, humanities courses where they interpret what a writer meant. And many writers, living writers who visited these courses said, I never meant that. <laughs> Arthur Miller once uh, was asked why he kills Willie Loman at the end of um, uh, Death of a Salesman. And he said, look, we were out of town in New Haven. We were, I was very tired. The other ending wasn't work. It was time to end. <laughs> I said, I said, just, just kill him at the end. <laughs> Everyone will be happy. Uh, and it, it is amazing how how um, how that happens. Uh, I, I think there is far too much interpretation of writers who never meant that the interpretation in the first place. Uh, it, 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 it's just a name I thought of one day. It fit a, a, the idea of a blog that dealt with important issues, and that's how it got its name. Was d the genesis of it? Did you did you sit down one day and say, "Aha, I'm going to do an urgent agenda"? Or was there something motivating you? I have a feeling it was the writer and editor in you that you said, "Okay," but I, I, that's my that's my gut telling me that. But what's well, the real story? I, I, I founded Urgent Agenda in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, the Internet was developing very rapidly. I mean, for goodness sake, I think the Internet in 1993 had 50 pages. Uh, in fact, I had one of the, uh, a subscription to one of the first uh, 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 Internet services, and I gave it up. I said, there's not enough here for me to, to, do, to do anything about. Well, it grew, of course, dramatically, and I thought, here's an opportunity to do what I've always wanted to do, which was to publish my own newspaper. I'm the editor, I'm the publisher, um, I'm uh, the, um, the um, editorial director. Any, any, any position you can name, I fill. But I really, of course, I'm just one person. But I have complete independence. I don't have to ask anyone's permission. Uh, I uh, work alone, and I'm alone right now. I like doing that. I would love to have interns uh, because I think I could teach them a great deal. Mm. But it is very dangerous today to have interns. If you have interns, yeah. you have to have uh, lawyers and you have to have uh, video surveillance of, of everything you're doing, uh, at least if you have uh, uh, female interns. So I decided not to go to go that route. And if, but, you hired, uh, if you hired only male, you'd be sued for, you know. For, for discrimination the other way, sure. <laughs> so, um, um, I, I, but I, I enjoy practicing the kind of journalism I believe in, mm -hmm. which is you'll, you'll notice if you read Urgent Agenda that some certain words, they are used, but they're used very rarely. One is the word may. I can't stand news, states, news stories that tell us what may happen. Why don't they tell us what may not happen? I don't, that's, to me, that's not real journalism. I mean, unless something is that important, that much a possibility that they feel they must do it, I don't do that. I don't make predictions. Yeah. Occasionally I might, but I don't make predictions. Aren't you amused by these people who say, as I predicted here uh, last year, well, he did, and he got it right. Now, tell us about the other 20 predictions you made that didn't come out right. So I don't, I don't make predictions. Um, I al always caution about the tentativeness of information, like polls. If we run a poll, I'll often say a poll is simply a snapshot in time. It may not last. Um, I'm very, I, I try to be careful about personal attacks. Sometimes we will use them in a humorous vein, but I don't believe in the viciousness of what is going on in politics. And I also believe very strongly that one of the things that is missing from journalism today is a real sense of history. And by history, I don't mean Howard Zinn. I mean real historians. You know, who, who, who. I'll give you some examples. We hear the word progressive being used all the time. We hear the word liberal being used all the time. They're often used interchangeably. They are not in any way interchangeable. There was a progressive movement. Uh, there was a liberal movement. They split rather badly in the 1940s. And progressivism is really a code word for the hard left. Uh, you know, you can ask them, uh, if you want to talk to them, why is it progressive to support dictatorial governments? Well, that's what some of them do. But you don't find journalists, if, if like CNN, which has all the time it needs. You can't give a network more than 24 hours a day. 
If somebody can find a way to do it, they'll be very rich. <laughs> but they, you know, they, they have re political reporters. They never sit down and explain to the reader what something really is, uh, what it means. Uh, you, you, you have conventions coming up. You have a presidential election coming up. I remember the days when we had reporters. I'm thinking specifically of Len O'Connor, who was a Chicago-based reporter for NBC, yep. who appeared on the air in his obese uh, nice. and a crumpled white shirt, but he knew every block of Chicago. The reporter who really knows the story, who isn't thinking of the next assignment, but wants to do this one well. We don't have that kind of reporting. I get the feeling that many people who work at news networks, write for national newspapers, really don't know much about the country. Um, I'll give you just an example of that. I once interviewed Charles Corot, who did the On the Road series for CBS mm -hmm. for years. And I asked him, and I said, Charles, in all the years of traveling around the United States, what is the most important thing you learn from talking to ordinary people? And without any hesitation, he said, I am always amazed at how well-informed Americans are. Now, that is something journalists don't like to hear. They, mm. they say, we're, we're the ones who are well-informed. Who are these fools, these deplorables? But the fact is that Americans are quite well-informed. They are interested. Uh, they may not be able to speak and, inter and, in uh, and speak about an issue the way a Columbia professor can speak about the issue. But if you look at, uh, at um, uh, rolling polls during election season, whenever something important happens, you see the polls change immediately. There is a big audience of informed people. I think they're getting less and less informed because the press is less and less good. But uh, he was this interview that I conducted with Corral was about... 1972. So we still had a very, very large number of members of the greatest generation still alive. We had World War II veterans who were um, oh, in their 50s and uh, very much interested because they knew, uh, as my editor at the New York Times used to say, that what happens in Asia can result in the drafting of a boy in Des Moines. And they understood it from personal experience. Oh, yeah. Um, and and we, what we have to do is we have to improve every aspect of our journalism, beginning with vocabulary. Words have lost their meaning. They really have lost their meaning. I mean, when people talk about the Democratic Party or the traditional Democratic Party, would you please, Mr. T Reporter, tell me what you mean by that? Specifically, what do you mean? We had a... a it, it, it actually isn't funny. It's serious, but I found it funny. Um, there, there has been a movement in New York City. It, it happens periodically uh, from the forces of evil to change the nature of what is known in New York City as the special high schools. These are the world-famous schools uh, in New York, the High School of Music and Art, the Fame School, um, the uh, Bronx High School of Science, uh, Stuyvesant High. These are elite schools which... Um, exist only for elite students and to get in you have to pass a very stiff examination. Well, we have a uh, superintendent of schools in, the, in New York City now, I don't live in New York City but I, I know the subject, who came to the conclusion that the schools did not reflect the population of New York City. They weren't supposed to, they weren't designed to. They were supposed yeah. to reflect the elite students in New York City who went on to, to great things. And um, he published the figures, and he said, this must not stand. Uh, the, it is racism. The exam is racist. That, that's what the only way you can interpret it. Well, we have a, um, a congresswoman from New York, uh, uh, AOC. You've probably heard of her. She's, we call her Evita from the Bronx uh, by way of Westchester County. Uh, and... She took the seven high schools and, uh, and uh, put their names down, and she said, this is what failure looks like. Mm. Now, it turns out six of the seven schools have student bodies that are mostly non-white. And you say, that's what failure looks like? Doesn't she think that that's what success looks like? But then you get into the subject of code language. The, our Asian, wonderful Asian students are not considered 
by the radical leftists to be non-white. It's terrible. I mean, it's really terrible. The term person of color is a code term. I, I'm not saying it in a derogatory way at all, right. but I wish some journalists would say, let's understand what we're talking about here. Uh, we're talking about one group, but other groups have been left out of that definition, and they, have, and they resent it. You know, Asian students recently uh, uh, sued Harvard University over admissions. They are right. becoming politically active in the way they're treated. Um, but it's things like that. We have to begin at the beginning. I feel that the profession, well, it's not a profession. Journalism is not a profession. They call it that, but it's not. Should do what airlines do. That every, just as every six months, I think some airlines, I know you, you know that business, correct me if I'm wrong, their pilots go right back into the simulators and go right back to basic training. And they have to, they check them out on all the basics of flight. I yep. think we need, we need that in journalism. I think we should demand that college professors on their sabbaticals not do something in their field. Go out and be a carpenter for a year. Do something that you've never done that will expose you to a new world. And the basic the people in journalism should go back for a week to a really good journalism school, and there are very few of them, or to a journalism program and relearn the basics. And I think that's where we have to begin. We're in trouble in journalism. We really are. Yeah, my dad is. My dad um, was a journalist. He was an official U.S. Army war correspondent and an editor of Stars and Stripes at the end of World War II. So I grew up with a lot of the same um, standards for reporters and editors. So I, I, I knew there was a. He, my dad would say. I, I'd asked him one time. Dad, why are you reading the Sun Times? You get the Sunday Sun Times and the Chicago Tribune on Sundays. Why do you do that? Why not just one? And he said, "Son, I wanna, I wanna see the slant to the news." Yes. And I thought, okay, but even back, and we were talking in the '70s and and into the '80s, when I was becoming more aware. Uh, even then, they weren't as um, what's the right word. They weren't as they weren't that far apart. Now it's all over the map. I mean, well, just, yeah, well, oof. you read you, you, that's right. You can read two papers covering the same story, and they're entirely different. Yeah. And that's not what the news pages were supposed to be about. Joseph Pulitzer was really the hero of journalism, which is why there's a Pulitzer Prize um, at the beginning of the 20th century. In the 19th century, newspapers actually were reflective of political parties. There was no claim to uh, objectivity. It was uh, a Democratic or a Republican paper. Pulitzer wanted to change that. He wanted to separate the news pages from the editorial pages. He was His idea was succeeding grandly, quite well, in fact, until I think the 60s came along and people had the idea of something called the new journalism, which would be on a higher intellectual level. Mm. Uh, I remember when I was on the Times, the executive editor, uh, Clifton Daniels, said, I want to know what the golfer was thinking. Well, anybody who's ever been in real journalism, and he was in real journalism, knows that's a ridiculous story. The only person who knows what the golfer was thinking is the golfer, which means there's no way to check the story. He'll tell you what he wants to tell you, and that's it. And they, and the, and, and the, we, we also must realize that the quality of our journalism is a direct reflection of the quality of our schools. They are the feeder system to journalism. At one time, very few journalists went to college. They went directly from high school, became copy boys and copy girls, and they worked their way up. Today, all journalists, really, are college graduates, and their journalism is going to reflect the standards that they learned in college. And those standards, I'm sorry to say, have slipped considerably. Yeah. Well, I know you went to the University of Chicago, and I grew up there, and I remember the oh, City News Bureau was... So, the, so did I. Yeah, that, University that was... University of Chicago. The City News Bureau was the... I think it was boot camp for reporters. It was. And and it was... They did a great job there. I mean, they some did. of the best reporters, uh, and I grew up watching them, reading them, and that was a great training ground. Yes, and, it was. There's, there's and something. Chicago was a great city to cover. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you could, if you survived, you know. 
where there's a will, there's a relative, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah and, that's and exactly right. Vote early, vote often, yes. Um, my dad also used to say that everything is related, and the big problem is seeing the relationships. And you've worked for three very different entities. Uh, you were a CIA officer. Uh, you worked as an editor for New York Times Magazine. And then you were uh, a pre-show -inter pre interviewer. You'll give me the correct terminology. Ta ta for talent things. coordinator. Talent coordinator for yes. the Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson. Yes. And so can you connect those dots for us? Where's oh, the sure. chronology there? I mean, what, what started when? Well, I went to uh, the University of Chicago and the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia. At the University of Chicago, I was the, um, <laughs> this is funny, I was the news director of WUCB. I want you to know that. Um, the, I wouldn't say it was a small station, but it didn't have an antenna. And in order to hear it, you had to plug your radio into the sockets in your dormitory room, which contained some sort of a wiring system that went to our studio, and they were the only people who could hear us. So it was, you know, it was not a world famous station. You didn't expect to hear Edward R. Murrow on WUCB. You heard me. So that's, that's where that started. But I also was an intern for a U.S. Senator named Paul Douglas, to my days as, as, as a liberal and a great war hero, by the way, which is why there's a Paul Douglas Center at Paris Island. Uh, he mm -hmm. was a, a great Marine. Uh, he was the oldest man in American history to go through Marine Corps training and, mm -hmm. and fought, fought in, in, in combat uh, in Palau and Okinawa, uh, where he was very severely wounded. So I got the bug for public affairs. I traveled around Illinois during the 60 campaign. We traveled with Kennedy learned an enormous amount about what a political campaign really is. Then after that, I went to graduate school of journalism. I, did, I, I decided not to go into journalism directly. I uh, went to the CIA, uh, and I just thought it would be an interesting thing to do. And it really was one of these things right out of a Hollywood movie. They advertise. They advertise for people, and if they like your resume, they call you, and you're interviewed by... Um, I was in, I won't mention his name because it's still classified ironically, but they, they have a meeting somewhere and this guy was right out of central casting. He was Ivy League and all, you, you had a feeling he had stepped right off the Mayflower, you know, <laughs> and into America. And, uh, and, and uh, he was, I mean, the, he was the image of the, of, of, of the intelligence officer. And I took a test and they liked me and, and so they hired me. And so, and I, and I, and I, I found myself right in the CIA, right before the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I wow. was in the CIA during that crisis on the same floor where that crisis was being handled. I walked in one morning, and uh, it, it was up uh, on, on one of the upper floors, and I didn't recognize what I was looking at. It, it was, there were cables all over the place and, and wires. And on each door where we used to just walk in was a code box. And they stopped me and they said, uh, we have uh, new installations this morning uh, at the direction of the director and uh, your number. And they gave me the number of the code box so I could get into my office. And I walked in and there was a, there were some guys at a big table looking at pictures. And one of them called me over, this guy I'd gotten to know. And he said, you want to see some pictures? I said, God, what kind of pictures? Uh, and they were the first pictures of the missiles on the uh, ships coming into Cuba. Wow. And I was absolutely amazed at what we had. And my first thought was, what is going on in Khrushchev's mind? I mean, he knows we have this capability. And um, I, I learned the capabilities of the National Photographic Interpretation Center. They were remarkable. And I did go through those 10 days, and they did take out the Red Books, which were the, uh, in the event Washington was attacked, where to go if you survived. Um, I had an apartment about a quarter of a mile from the White House, and I didn't think those Red Books were going to do me any good. <laughs> you know, my first concern was I had just bought my first car, uh, you know, with the ticket books where you each month pay a certain amount on the car. And my first question was, if I'm vaporized, 
do my parents have to make the car payments? <laughs> that was that's the kind of thing you think about. Well, but it was a, it, it was fascinating. Was it, so that was in just before the Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962, 62. which is about was that before or after Doctor No came out? I think it was the same year. Dr. Same year, yeah. Yes. I think it was later in the year that. Oh wait, maybe it wasn't. I think. Are you thinking of uh, of that yes. or seven or seven days in May or? Um, oh, I'm thinking. Doctor I'm Strange thinking Love. I'm thinking Bond, James Bond. Yeah. <laughs> so I, Drunk, you know, CIA Drunk and you know, Sean yes. Connery and oh hey, sign me up for that. Yeah, okay. Um, so, what attracted you to to serving there? I mean, what was it that that I, I think that just fascination. I, I, I did not know if I wanted to make it my career, and I eventually decided not to. But just fascination to be on the inside of America's spy agency. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and uh, of course, you, the first thing you learn about intelligence is that most of it is deadly dull. You know, most information gathering, 80% actually is gathered openly. But even part that it isn't, most of it is not information that you must know to live your life like the dimensions of the new German uh, cement factory. I mean, this is not something I want to discuss on my next date. <laughs> and I found, I found out the, yes, if I found out the dates weren't interested either, you know? Right. Uh, I had, I, I, my first service in the CIA was on the open side, where you could say you worked for the CIA. Mm -hmm. uh, the second part was on the dark side. Now people say, well, how can you be open and then go to the dark side? And the answer is that for certain people, they would put you on the dark side under what they called fragile cover. It wasn't deep cover. And the purpose was that, you would, they, that, that there was no direct written relationship with the agency so that if you got tagged overseas, if you were in Germany, and the Russians wanted to expose you and embarrass the United States and they knew who you were, they had no documentation. That, uh, it was a, light, a form of light cover just to protect the country against embarrassment the deep cover agents never came anywhere near the cia yeah. i mean they were they you know that was a whole different thing but i i left and um decided well this is not what i want to do for the rest of my life and i had had to do my army service so i enlisted in the national guard and i got out of the army the hour president kennedy was assassinated mm. just unbelievable we, we 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 drove into manhattan from fort dix which is where i was assigned. Uh, Fort Dix was probably the easiest of the basic training centers, or as they called it, the candy ass army. I mean, I was, I, my, the, the second part after basic training was they put me in a job where they actually, I am not kidding you, by the way, where they actually had flowers on the chow tables. And there was, they, there was, they had little flowers. I mean, they, I think they put all we misfits who they suspected of probably being enemy agents in this section because we were literate and uh, you, you didn't have to go to, uh, they never called Reveille, you just were told what time to show up and very, very light, wow. very, very light. I mean, I actually, I had a, I had a good, a good time in the army, uh, out of the army and um, again, I delayed my entry into journalism because I got an offer to, to work at the Hudson Institute, which is a, a national security and foreign policy research center and to be a, a assistant to Herman Kahn. Herman Kahn was one of the great strategists of the Cold War, very controversial man because people thought he was Dr. Strangelove. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I found that a fascinating year. Um, uh, and then I got an offer to go to the New York Times where I stayed for, I think, is it five years or six years? Uh, and that was, that was, um, it was a, it was a quite an experience because my first job at the time was to be assistant to one of the editors who actually was semi-retired. And because he was, had been so prestigious, they gave him an office on the 14th floor, which is the top floor of the Times, where very few people in the Times ever go. Very few people have ever been on the 14th floor. And they didn't have an office for me there. And so the so Bill was roaming the halls. <laughs> no, no, it's a much better story. The publisher, Punch, who who I was introduced to immediately, very few people ever met Punch, said, you know, we don't have an office for you, Bill, but we do have the safe room, which is, the New York Times keeps it safe, and it's big enough for a desk. Would you mind? 
being there. I was 10 feet from the publisher. I think I could handle this, you know? I mean, I, I, I was walking into executive offices. I, I learned about the, the transfer of the first American troops to Vietnam sitting on the desk of Arthur Hayes Salzberger, who was the chairman of the board of the New York Times and who did elderly man. He didn't come in regularly. And he was the only one who had a TV set. And I knew the president was going to speak. So I just walked in, sat on his desk and watched history happen. And right on the wall next to me was a bar relief map of Korea that had been given to him during the Korean War uh, by General MacArthur. Wow. So for a kid uh, going into journalism, to have that opportunity to be on that floor where, where all the major decisions were made, uh, and uh, when Scotty Reston became executive editor, he, he had an office on the news floor, but he also had an office on the 14th floor. And I would go by, say hello, as if saying hello to a friend. And I was spoiled rotten. I mean, I was absolutely spoiled rotten. Yeah, I'd uh, say so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's... Uh, and I think that when I later went to the magazine as an editor, uh, I could sense a tinge of resentment on the part of some of the guys who'd been at the Times 40 years. Who the hell is this kid? He knows the publisher. He knows the chairman. Uh, <laughs> We had an office on the 14th floor. punched the other day, yes. Uh, yes, and, 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 and I realized that it wasn't doing me any good. I wasn't making any fast friends. So, um, but but it was a very interesting experience. And and then you went to the Tonight Show. Uh, you know, people questioned me about. That. I said, "How can you go from the New York Times?" Um, uh, uh, um, the the uh, you know the so-called premier newspaper to a show where it's all about humor and fiction and made up stories. And I said, think about that for a minute. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it wasn't that difficult to transition. Uh, it wasn't to, to a degree somewhat embarrassing. People wondered, how can you leave the New York Times? Because sure. there was the, the belief that you never left the New York Times. I mean, I used to say to people, there are dead bodies sitting at desks. They never wanted to leave. And, um, uh, and why? Because once you made it to the Times, it was the pinnacle of journalism, so-called. People would stay there just to say to go to go so, so they could go to parties and say, "I'm Jones of the New York Times." They loved institutional prestige. One of the lessons I learned in life is one of the worst traps you can get into is the institutional prestige trap of going to an organization because it's prestigious, hating what you're doing. And okay. never going anywhere, just so you can say you're there. Big mistake that a lot of people yeah. make. Yeah, a lot of young people are making that mistake now. Too. Oh yes, very much so. So, as a talent coordinator for the Tonight Show, your job was interviewing guests, and I'm taking a wild guess—not a wild guess, maybe an educated guess. You were doing pre-interviews so that. Johnny would have some talking points prepared in his mind for that particular guest. How, That's how exactly I... right. Well, there, there are basically se several functions of a talent coordinator. Some, at some shows, they're called segment producers. We, in effect, produced a segment of the show. Hmm. Your first responsibility was to find talent, new talent. You know, it's, it's easy to pull James Stewart's name out of a hat. That's easy. But to find the next James Dean, that's hard. And so uh, we, we were always on the lookout for talent. It was actually a, a, a pretty nice job to have because you got tickets to all the Broadway shows. You got tickets to anything you wanted to see. Um, and uh, so, what? Job perks. <laughs> oh, and there really were perks. And you took people to lunch. And it, it was very nice. But once somebody was booked, the, the next phase of your job was to pre-interview. Uh, the Tonight Show was was not a scripted show, but it was not a completely unrehearsed show. Johnny always had notes, uh, as you said before, about what this person was going to say, what stories the person was going to uh, tell, little things about the person's background, and those notes went to two people, the, uh, Johnny and the head writer. And the head writer and his staff would write in little responses that Johnny could give to the talking points. We had the talking points and then the responses to the talking points. And those were the jokes. 
So uh, it was a it was a it was a responsible job. You had to in effect shape the person uh, for the show, make certain the, that the person the, the people who appeared on the show, including stars, understood it was Johnny's show, and make that person look good. Right. Yeah. That and was a big, that was a big deal for him. He very big deal. That. Yeah. Well, he was mentored. The importance of mentors, something that is also very important. I don't think kids today get proper mentoring. He was mentored by Jack Benny, who was one of his boyhood idols. And one of the things uh, that uh, he, he would always stress to Johnny is, Johnny, the whole show has to be good, not just you. If you think you can be good and everyone else can flop and, and you'll have a show, uh, you won't have a show. It's, it's your job to make everyone good. And he told the story of the people who would ask him, Jack, I heard your show last night on radio. Why do you give the best lines to other people? And he said, I don't really care who has the best lines. All I care about is people standing around the water cooler the next day at work saying, wasn't the Jack Benny show good last night? And that's, that's the way you put on a show. Yeah. It's, a, it's all about entertaining mm. the audience. Yes. You're oh. there for the audience. That's the key. The, the, audi the audience is the key. And I wish some people today would recognize that it is not an opportunity for the host to express his political views. Yes. Mm -hmm. what, what would surprise people about your role there? I don't think anything would surprise them. I think I had a good background for it. I think journalism was a good background for it. Um, I also was, uh, uh, was, was a comedy writer. I, I started my in independent career by writing for, for Bob Newhart. And I got to write for Bob Newhart by doing one of the stupidest things you can do in the business. I mean, you know, it's always the, the, the story of the, the guy who hits the jackpot by doing something dumb because he doesn't know it's dumb. You know? mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I thought, well, I have some ideas for some comedy things, and I always liked Bob Newhart. I saw one of his earliest performances in Chicago when he was still an accountant. Always liked him. And I thought, I think I'm going to write something for Bob Newhart. And Gosh, jolly, jolly whiz, how would I do that? Well, right out of the Hollywood movie, I would write it, I would find out who his agent was, and I would send it to him. Well, of course, in 99.9999% of the cases, nobody will read it. You know, it'll just lie on a desk. But I did call the, uh, I think, uh, one of the Hollywood unions, I think it was probably uh, after, and I said, could, could I find out Bob Newhart's agent. And he said, yes, they can, that's open information. They gave me the name, they gave me the address. And, and I said, dear sir, <laughs> I have always liked Johnny, uh, not Johnny Carson, Bob Newhart, and I've written something for him. Would you please read it and send it to him? And if you're interested, just call me. And sure enough, the agent read it. He loved it. He sent it to Bob Newhart, who loved it, and they bought it. And that was how I got my start in that business. Wow. wow. And there, Absu absolute amateurism. Well, it's, sometimes it's easier to get for, for, uh, forgiveness than permission, right? You, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it is what it is. And, and you know, I, I'm, I think back to Johnny Carson. He was a very talented and very, he was very complex, too. Yes, yeah, oh, very. Most, yeah. most highly successful people are. Um, I then you have Bob Newhart. Was Bob Newhart your boss? I mean, how did, how did that? Oh, no, 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 no. He, I just wrote to him uh, and um, I didn't know him. I'd never met him. He bought the material, but that got me signed by William Morris. He sold material to Bob Newhart. Uh, and then when I joined the Tonight Show, he would be, periodically be the guest host. And that was the first time we met. Oh, wow. And, and we didn't keep up the contact. That was one of my mistakes. I, I, I wish I had kept up contact with him. But there was no professional reason to he, kind of lose those contacts. When I read that, that you were a writer for him, I, I've been a big fan of Bob Newhart for so long. He's such a great storyteller, oh, yeah. which is what we need more of. And the fact that he's still at it, he's still performing. And I, I guess that kind of longevity says a lot about his talent. Yes. Well, he was kind of an original. He did these telephone routines, mm -hmm. you know, where, where you, you imagine what was being said on the other end. And, and they were hilarious, and, and that's what I did when I when I sent my material out. 
um, I, I knew his, his style and I wrote it. I wrote a sketch about a college dean being tied up in his office by protesting students and getting a phone call out and what he was telling the people at the other end and them not believing it. Is that on video somewhere? No, it was used in his nightclub act and I don't, don't actually have, I guess I have a copy, a written copy of it somewhere. Oh, but, okay. I, and, the, and the second thing I sent to him was a, you, you, you know these news stories, this is the way he would say, you know these news stories about birth control pills where they're 98% effective? And the sketch was about a doctor calling a woman who's in the 2%. <laughs> Explaining it to her. Hello. You did hello. that hello. Uh, Yes, I wrote that, yes. I said, hello, hello, Florence. <laughs> this, is, this is Dr. Kane. How you doing, Florence? <laughs> Have I got some news for you. <laughs> I can hear him doing it, too. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm crying. It's, it's too good. He, um, I think there's a three-way a three way tie in my favorite Bob Newhart sketches. Um Sir Walter Raleigh calling the office, bus driver training, and then my, I guess my all-time favorite was the Miss, Mrs. Grace L. Ferguson, Storm Door and Airline Company. Yeah. Those three just kill me. They just kill me, and it's so creative. And so you mentioned something about, which I really liked, the having a desk in the New York Times safe. Was that where the money was kept, or is that where, like, the... the the crown jewels of information were kept. The crown jewels <clears throat> were kept there. Uh, it actually was not where the money was kept. They called it the safe room. I think the Times kept its money in banks like sure. uh, yeah. most companies. But uh, the, the publisher walked in one day and he said, I wonder what's in that safe. And he said, I don't think we have a key to it. Or uh, the combination rather, not, not the key. But he knew John Moslem, who was the head of, it was a Moslem safe. I think I'm going to call them, <clears throat> and they can send over these crews. They can open any of their safes. Sure. And he called them, and they came with the crew to open the safe. And inside was a Pulitzer Prize. And I remember the moment when they took it out and they showed it to the publisher. <laughs> I said, "Wow, they they win a lot of Pulitzer prizes, but usually they kept them <laughs> in a more visible sight than this Pulitzer Prize." But inside was a Pulitzer Prize, and that's all that was in the safe. So um, the ground so, jewels, in fact. So I want to I want to wrap things up a bit to get to your suggestions because this uh, becoming better editors of our personal news feeds because there's so many sources, millions of sources, including this one. What suggestions do you have for getting more balance and some objectivity? I mean, how? Maybe it's how you edit Urgent Agenda, but I think people need, I, I think they need some tools, the questions to ask about when they're looking at something. How do I know I'm, I'm not being played by this article? What do you think? Well, I think, first of all, it, it is a function that shouldn't be necessary. The public shouldn't have to do that. They have to do it today. And... They do it two ways. It's interesting that the public has detected it. There's no question that the public has detected bias. And it's, it stems from the, the fact that the newspapers, or and the press generally, has violated one of the fundamental rules of journalism, which, is, which always leads to trouble. And that is you cannot tell people they don't see what they actually see. And when you put on a news story and you tell them there's no crime problem, this is in your imagination, and, and your, 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 your mother-in-law just got hit over the head right outside the window, you're not doing too well as, as a journalist. I think confirmation bias can only be fought by, the, by an info, a public that is already informed through other sources. Mm -hmm. They can fight it newspaper by newspaper. They can refuse to watch a television station, which is clearly happening at CNN. I mean, the audience for CNN is one-third of one percent of the American people. And they call themselves the first name in news. I mean, that's that's not the first name in news. No. And also a better educational system. I think every, for, I've always believed that every student graduating from high school should have to take a course. It may only be a three-week course in the Constitution. Everybody should know the Constitution. It shouldn't just be. And they should have to take I a did. course. And yes, 
They should have to, they should be required to take a really good course in how to read a newspaper. The, the schools used to have courses like that. And they would yeah. teach kids, uh, 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 the newspapers would cooperate, the kids would subscribe, and somebody would teach them, well, this is, you look at a story like this, these are the things you should be asking. And that can be educated into people to some degree. But it's a long haul. I think the change will only come generation, generationally. I think this in incident, not incident, but this crisis we're going through today might have some effect. But I, 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 I can't guarantee that it will. Yeah, yeah. We're f it's, it's, I, I'm very happy that we have um, other sources of news. When I, when I was growing up in Chicago, we had the three major networks. We had WGN, WCFL, we had WTTW. Um, and we had the two newspapers, Tribune and Sun Times. And so those were kind of our major news outlets. We also had radio stations. And, and again, the quality of that reporting was, was, as you said, very good. At least when I was growing up, I know before the Vietnam War, it was a little different. But after the Vietnam War, there was a lot more hard news. They really put their nose to the grindstone. And so I consider myself blessed for watching them in action. And I don't think I don't think later generations have been blessed by that. Mm. They don't see the. Good I think you're right. Well. So it's really about asking what's really going on here. I mean, how are we? How are we being played today? It's it's a significant problem. It is a significant problem. Now, it's it's not a new problem. Right. Uh, it, it, it's been pointed out that in 1936, for example, virtually all the major newspaper publishers of the United States were Republicans. And yet Roosevelt won in a landslide. Well, one of the reasons he won in a landslide is that the reporters were Democrats. And they they kind of straightened out the publishers on the news pages. Um, so, you know, you can have bias within papers and still have a reasonable product. But I think there has to be a sense of seriousness on the part of the news reader or the news viewer, a sense that these are serious times. That is one of the things that's lacking. You know, the word crisis is vastly overused. But I think if we do have a crisis in this country, a continuing crisis, it's a maturity crisis. This is, in many respects, a very immature country. It's, it's sad. It wasn't at one time. Uh, as I said, you know, when I was a little boy, you could go down a block where I lived or any block in America, and there's Phil, who was a B-17 uh, tail gunner, true. Next to Phil, next door neighbor, was a guy who got hit by a mortar shell and will be limping the rest of his life. On the other side of Phil was a, a guy who was a merchant captain, was sunk twice. They had lived real lives, and, and we, don't, we don't have that today. We don't have a sense of seriousness and the sense of danger, the sense that this could really do us in, we better take care of it. That the, the young generation, nothing, they're good kids. I mean, they're I'm sure as fine as any kids we ever produced, but they have never had that sense of strife that, you know, I could be killed tomorrow morning. And without that, you're not going to get a better press. They, they didn't grow up during the Cold War. No, they don't know what the, if, if anything, they think we were the, the aggressors because the schools are so left wing today. And that is, is extending down into elementary school. Uh, and they did not feel the sense of personal involvement that that previous generation felt. Boy. I mean, you know, you see your son going off to war, you know what, you know what the consequences are. Uh, or in the depression before it where to have a quarter for milk was a big deal. And they grew up in that era. And uh, kids today grow up in a very soft era, and they don't realize it. They're very fortunate. They and certainly it are. Paid, it was paid for by a lot of people. It sure was. And, and blood and money. It, it certainly was. And, and, and they, they, I think many do. I mean, especially in the heartland of the country. Yeah. Uh, many do. But, uh, boy, when you look at some of the attitudes in the universities, that is a... That, that correct view of history, that 
idea of sacrifice is a very rare one. Well, I've... I could have you go on for probably another hour just on Hollywood and what's going on out there. But uh, our our time is... is I, t- I told you I'd try keeping it to a dull roar. Right. I've enjoyed it so much. Believe me, I'm, I, I thank you so much for your insights and your service and for joining me. Um, William Katz of virginagenda.com, thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Well, to our viewers, thank you too. And there are some notable links in the description, uh, including a link to Urgent Agenda. And please share your thoughts below and subscribe too if you don't mind. We appreciate your support. And I want to leave you with a quote from Rudyard Kipling. And he said, let me get this right, my notes in my, there we go. Kipling said, I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names were what and why and when and how and where and who. And until next week, there you are.